Good to see you all uh, for our fourth and final um, summer salon conversation. Uh, please, you could join us. Uh, we'll do a quick round of kind of USN introductions before we introduce our uh, featured speaker for the evening. All right, let's go to Nicole Jules in my upper left corner. Hello everyone, my name is Nicole Jules and I'm the Dean of Students in the High School. Glad you're all here. Dana Mayfield. How about I do that where you can hear it? Uh, I'm Dana Mayfield, uh, freshman class dean, also teach um, high school English. I'm going to go to Roderick White next. Hello, everyone. Roderick White, Director of Diversity and Community Life. So excited to see everyone here. Can't wait to get going. And Ms. Trauber, take us home. Hi, I'm Juanita Trauber, Communications Director, and just a friendly reminder that we're recording tonight's session to post it on YouTube. All right, uh, so welcome again to our fourth uh, Salon Series Conversation. Uh, as we kind of round the corner and head for a home, uh, in, in my hopes, this is a way for us to tie some of our work together. Uh, earlier in the summer, we looked at uh, kind of a very contemporary moment around Black Lives Matter. Uh, we looked at some historical lenses in our next Salon series, thinking about civil rights and national icons and their stories and what we can glean from those stories. Last week, we moved into thinking about intersectionality and how different pieces of both personal and communal identity intersect and interplay with one another. Uh, as it comes into community uh, activism. This week we look at uh, this notion of how do we build a sustained commitment to act uh, as juxtaposed with this notion of performative allyship, uh, which we've seen surface in kind of the collective conscious in the past several months. Uh, it's been around for much longer, but it's something that I think people are attentive to right now. Uh, this evening, uh, we've, we've moved out of the Nashville area and, and gone a bit further away to bring someone in for a conversation. Uh, we're so pleased to have with us Dr. Nee Corterlai Corte. Uh, he's a senior advisor and national LGBT liaison at AARP. For our students, feel free to, to look AARP up if that's not something you're familiar with. I hope you did some homework ahead of time. Uh, that's one of his roles. I think you'll find uh, an expansive amount of roles that we will talk through tonight in different things that Dr. Cordelai Corte finds himself involved with in different spheres. Uh, he, he holds a teaching appointment in the MBA program at the University of Maryland and the School of Business, uh, a graduate of Pepperdine University, as well as the University of Southern California. As we kind of prepped for our tonight's conversation, it's really gonna be an informal chance for Dr. Cordelai Corte to speak to us, share a bit about his story and journey with advocacy in this world. Um, I'll have a few questions perhaps along the way, and then we're gonna turn it to you all. Uh, again, students, alumni, and certainly parents as well uh, to ask questions, to get thoughts, uh, and see how things go. So please, you're here. Uh, and would love to turn it over to you for your, uh, your wisdom to share with us. Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Quentin. Uh, and thanks to all of you for hopping uh, on this Zoom call. Um, I am uh, really uh, thrilled to be here. Um, I wish I could physically be there in Nashville. Uh, I had some really great barbecue last time I was in Nashville. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the spot, uh, but uh, very fond memories of uh, being in Nashville. Uh, and so hopefully when we're on the other side of this pandemic, um, uh, I can be invited back in person 
that's my goal. That's my goal. Um, you know, as Quentin mentioned, I really want this to be sort of an informal conversation. Uh, and uh, um, I want you to uh, consider three things. One, I want you to think about your lived experience. As I share a little bit about mine, I want you to think about your lived experience. And for uh, the high school students that are a part of this conversation, um, you know, we know that your lived experience is still becoming, but it's a lived experience nonetheless. Um, two, I want you to think about your lens. You know, uh, I wear glasses. You probably don't want to see me on the road not wearing glasses. Um, uh, that's intended to be a, a joke. Uh, <laughs> um, but I want everyone to think about uh, the lenses that you put on each and every day. And I want you to think about how you see the world. And I want you to consider how other people might even see you, how they might see you, your allyship or lack thereof, how they might see you as a champion um, or maybe not champion enough. And then three, I want you to consider how you might channel your activism differently. You know, we are living in turbulent times, um, but what a great time to be a leader, to be alive and to be a leader. You know, uh, all of the challenges that we see when we turn on the news and when we uh, open the paper, if we open the paper, some of us just get the digest in our email, um, but whatever way, you know, you stay on top of what's happening in the world around us, what a tremendous time to be a leader what a tremendous time to summon other folks to a higher level of consciousness on the issues that um, we deeply connect with. And so those are the three things that I want you all to consider uh, as we begin our chat. Um, I wanna first, first start off by sharing a story. Um, and I rarely share this story, um, uh, but uh, especially uh, these days with uh, the fervent call for racial justice, not just across the country, but around the world, uh, I feel that this story is particularly relevant. Uh, and I shared with Quentin last time we spoke uh, the story of my 18th birthday. Um, and in the chat, I don't know how many of you can uh, uh, confirm whether or not you uh, are 18 or uh, if you're about to turn 18, uh, but uh, this story may resonate with you. Uh, it was my 18th birthday, and you know, everybody has their crew. Uh, and in my crew, um, one of my best friends, Jazz, he's, who's still one of my best friends so many years later, uh, he was the only other person in my crew that was 18. Uh, and so after having a little birthday dinner, uh, we decided we were gonna go to the club because that's what you could do when you turn 18 is you could go to the club. Uh, and so uh, we got in the car, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so we drove to the city. We drove to San Francisco uh, and we had parked the car and we're, you know, walking to the club. Uh, and, you know, we noticed that there was an unmarked vehicle some, some guy in an unmarked vehicle, you know, sort of drove by slowly and, you know, it was just sort of, you know, staring at us. Um, you know, we just sort of dismissed it as, you know, it's, it's San Francisco. So sometimes you, know, you see some odd stuff in San Francisco. Um, we continued uh, on our way to the club. We get to the corner, we cross the street. We're probably 300 or 400 feet away from the front of the club and a San Francisco police car comes racing down Broadway in San Francisco, comes to a screeching halt right in front of us, and officers jumped out, guns drawn. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Now, being 18, maybe a little bit sheltered, um, 
I looked to Jazz and said, you know, Jazz, I think we walked into something. <laughs> Uh, and Jazz said, no, fool, <laughs> they are pointing these guns at us. How could they be pointing these guns at us? We did, we did nothing wrong. The officers proceeded to handcuff us, to seat us on the edge of the curb, uh, to take our driver's license and run our, run our IDs. Jazz was definitely more, uh, more docile, more, co more compliant, um, less questioning of the officer's uh, intent or authority uh, than I was. Uh, respectful, but you know, asking questions like, what's your badge number? Why are you doing this, right? Questions that have agitated uh, officers in too many situations that we have read about and learned about uh, in um, uh, similar situations that folks weren't able to walk away from. After sitting there for 20 minutes, which felt like an eternity, people walking by us, looking at us as if we were criminals, the police officer walks over, uncuffs our handcuffs, throws our driver's licenses at us, and said that you two fit the description of two black young men that had been burglarizing cars in the neighborhood. Good night. My 18th birthday. Earlier, you might remember that I asked you to think about your lived experience. What I just shared with you is a lived experience that I had, and a lived experience that still to this day, one of my best friends, Jazz, had with me. And there is not an incident of um, police misconduct, and incidents of overuse of force uh, reported by a police officer in exchange with you know, a black man. There is not an instance where no matter where I am in the country and where Jazz is, we don't text each other or call each other and say, did you see that? Knowing that our story could have been their story. Our story could have been their story. You know, when I shared this story with some of my older brothers, surprisingly, my oldest brother is 15 years older than me. When he was a teenager, he had a similar situation. You know, and talking to my dad and some of my father's friends, they had similar situations. So generation after generation after generation, we seem to be pressing repeat on these exchanges with law enforcement. And it is this lived experience that I draw from in the movement building work that I get to be a part of. And so, you know, this evening, I really want to speak to you, um, not so much as, you know, senior advisor of AARP, leading LGBTQ affairs, among other things, but I want to speak to you as a movement builder. Uh, because that's what excited me the most about having this opportunity to talk with you this evening, is that I see so many of you as movement builders, as up and coming movement builders, as champions, you know, as, you know, uh, and I say champions instead of allies, because, you know, ally to me um, is the least that you can do. It's the least that you can do. Uh, and I know this, this talk is in response to questions around performative allyship. So you said the thing. So you tweeted the thing. You posted the thing. You might have even tattooed Black Lives Matter somewhere. Um, but there's a difference between our espoused values and walking the walk. There's a difference between our espoused values 
and demonstrating those values in action. You know, I think, I think someone might have said that um, justice is love out loud. Justice is love out loud. Um, so I want to encourage us to go beyond the hashtag of Black Lives Matter. As important as that hashtag is in terms of summoning the kind of consciousness that it has across the country and around the world, I want us to push ourselves to go past the hashtag and to consider what is it that we are doing or what is it that we can do to make Black Lives Matter. And when I talk about Black Lives, I'm talking about Black Lives in the fullest sense of it. I, you know, I share a radically inclusive idea of Black Lives uh, in alignment with Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal, the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. Um, it wasn't heterosexual Black Lives. You know, it was all Black Lives. You know, it, it wasn't LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual, Black lives. Sorry, transgender folks, right? It wasn't that. It was intended to be radically inclusive. And so we need to think about what are we doing and what can we do more of to make Black lives matter. Um, you know, Qu Quentin uh, shared a little bit about my credentials. Um, you, know, uh, you know, it's lovely to have several degrees you know, work very hard for them. Uh, and, you know, some might even say that uh, there's so much in my bio that um, might meet the criteria for black excellence, for black excellence. Uh, and when we say black excellence for, for folks that um, may not understand the fullness of what that means, so many of us grew up and our parents grew up and our grandparents grew up uh, teaching us that you had to be prepared to work twice as hard for half as much, right? And so there's being excellent, and then for so many of us, it's, there's there's it's being there's being black excellent, right? Recognizing uh, exactly that that some of us have to work harder than others in order to get the same thing. You know, we are positioned differently. Um, you hear folks like Kimberly Crenshaw and so many other scholars talk about intersectionality. And I, I challenge the folks that are listening to, you know, look up that term. I think Kimberly Crenshaw did a wonderful TED talk um, that really breaks that down. But simply put, it takes into account that our proximity to power is not the same. And, and that some of us come from traditionally marginalized groups. And based upon our identity, some of us um, may represent multiple marginalized groups. So if I were a black transgender woman, for example, um, the level of challenge and discrimination, uh, the limitations in terms of economic opportunity uh, impact would impact me as somebody that is black, as somebody that is a woman, and as somebody that is transgender. Uh, and so it means that as we develop solutions, as we develop standards and practices and policies, as we create a, a more accepting culture, uh, we have to take into account that some of us have to work harder than others. Uh, some of us are more vulnerable than others. Uh, and it's on all of us uh, to respond to that. So um, also keep in mind that Black excellence um, doesn't save you. You know, the, the story I just shared with you about my encounter at 18 years old with the San Francisco Police Department didn't matter what family I came from. It didn't matter 
that I was a private school kid. It didn't matter that I was class president. Uh, none of those things mattered. I fit the description of. That's it. You just fit the description of. Um, so, you know, uh, as important as black excellence is, black excellence uh, won't um, necessarily save our lives. And that is a difficult idea to wrestle with. Um, so it's important that at, for the folks that are becoming better allies and for the folks that are, are set on be, becoming um, stronger champions, that you consider that. I want to talk about representation. Representation matters. It does. You know, we've got to stop and think, uh, you know, who is um, sitting at the table, um, who should be at the table, who's missing from the table. Uh, those are all important things for us to consider. And, you know, recently, uh, you know, as I was preparing for our conversation today, I um, stumbled upon uh, uh, some writings from uh, Dr. D.L. Stewart over at Colorado State University. Dr. D.L. Stewart uh, goes by he, him pronouns and they, them pronouns. Um, and uh, Dr. Stewart so brilliantly writes that diversity asks who, who's in the room. Equity responds Who's trying to get in the room but can't? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? Inclusion asks, have everyone's ideas been heard? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority? Diversity then asks, how many more of, and pick any marginalized group, do we have this year compared to last year? Equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as the perpetual majority here? Inclusion then asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong. Finally, justice challenges, saying whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views. Dehumanizing views. So when we think about representation, there's an opportunity for us to go deeper than just what people look like at the table. And I'll be sure to share um, what I just um, quoted from Dr. D.L. Stewart at Colorado State University. I'll be sure to share that with Quentin um, afterwards, uh, as I'm sure you all may wanna explore that further. Uh, but when it comes to representation, you know, another uh, movement builder, and uh, I'm trying to cite as many other movement builders as I can uh, to uh, uh, not just enrich this conversation, but, but uh, continue the shelf life of this conversation even beyond uh, our time together. Uh, I'm thinking of Rashad Robinson. And Rashad Robinson is the president of colorofchange.org. Uh, he is a, a, a friend, uh, he is a, a movement builder, he is a dynamic individual. And we had a chance to um, participate in uh, a leadership forum uh, in early June, uh, organized by a group called Native Sun. And one of the things that Rashad talked about was the difference between presence and power presence versus power. And, you know, you know, when people say, 
you know, oh, you know, so and so was the first head of fill in the blank, you know, you know, the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama, the first fill in the blank. Those that their presence matters and those symbols uh, matter. But it's important that we don't um, take our eye off of the opportunity to build power. To build power, right? You know, it's it's not just about being um, a champion or you know a, a, a person of color in a high place. We'll put it that way, right? You know, but what are we doing to build up other leaders? What are we doing to not just master the uh, game that's being played, but what do we do to change the game? I have a feeling that on this call that a number of you are change makers. A number of you are game changers. I'm betting that a number of you are game changers. I'm betting that your administrators and your teachers and your parents that are also on this call are here that send you to this school because they've also placed a bet on you, that you have the potential to be a game changer in your community. And part of how people change the game is they build power. You know, it's not just about being, you know, the first, but it's what are you, what are you doing to make sure you're not the last? So I want you to consider that. Um, you know, one of my mentors uh, was Willis Edwards. Willis Edwards, he was on the national board of the NAACP. I met Willis Edwards when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Southern California. Uh, and uh, he was uh, charismatic, he was persistent. Um, uh, he believed deeply in justice. Uh, he believed deeply in black people. Um, and uh, one of the lessons that he taught me very early as I was, you know, uh, a baby movement builder. <laughs> Do what you can from where you are with what you have. Sometimes we feel absolutely overwhelmed with whatever need we see in our communities, whatever need we see in our nation, whatever level of need we see uh, around the world, um, and especially these days. You know, I mean, we are up against a triple pandemic pandemic as it relates to economic insecurity as a result of this recession. You know, we're also up against the pandemic of racism and the fight for racial justice. And last but certainly not least, we're, we're up against the pandemic, pandemic that we know as COVID-19. Uh, it's a tr the triplet pandemics. And there is no shortage of work to do. But I submit to you, do what you can from where you are with what you have. You know, if you're, if you're waiting to um, be able to uh, bank, um, bank millions of dollars so that you can change the world through your philanthropy, um, you know, you don't have to wait till then. There, there's plenty that you can do now. Um, you know, you don't have to wait, you know, to channel your activism. There are opportunities to channel your activism every single day. You know, I, I, uh, uh, in late May, when um, the Black Lives Matter protest, you know, were um, at a very high point, uh, and I read the New York Times uh, that morning, and I saw that uh, uh, maybe 1,700 protesters, peaceful protesters, had been arrested across the country. And I, you know what I decided to do? Um, I decided to donate to bail funds in different parts of the country. I donated to bail funds in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I grew up. I, go, I donated to uh, the Bail Project. Uh, where one of my friends is the general counsel there. They're doing incredible work across the country. Uh, I donated to the, the uh, Minnesota Freedom Fund uh, uh, as well, 
right? That's, uh, that's just, that's one thing I did. I was probably one of thousands of people that decided to channel their activism in that way. But, you know, that's how simple it can be sometimes. You know, we don't need to make, you know, activism so complicated. Do what you can from where you are with what you have. Um, as, as I prepare to wrap up and, and, you know, really dig into some of your questions, I see the, the chat box is hot. Um, uh, agents of change, I want you to remember, I want you, I want you all to walk away from this conversation, really thinking about your activism differently and thinking about yourselves differently. Each and every one of you are the unit one of analysis when it comes to change. One of the things that they taught us in graduate school is that you can't change nothing until you begin to change yourself. You are the unit one of analysis. Um, Peter Singe is the author of a book called The Fifth Discipline. You should check that out, The Fifth Discipline. Uh, Peter Singe is a very celebrated, a widely celebrated learning theorist. And you know, when he talks about transformation, you know, he says something I've never forgotten, that transformation happens when we're willing to begin to re-examine some of our underlying assumptions. I'll say it again, transformation happens when we're willing to begin to re-examine some of our underlying assumptions. And, and so I wanna leave you with this. We have an opportunity to be a rainbow in the cloud for somebody. How will we do it? How, consistently, how consistent will we be at doing that? You know, how can we get, go beyond simple gestures, right? And, and, and um, really get to the root cause of, of what, may be calling, what, what, what may be causing pain and anxiety. The thing at the root that may not help people to feel like they belong. You know, what can we do to affirm the humanity of all people, you know? So even though you know I lead our LGBTQ fairs work at AARP, um, that is my job. I, I and I enjoy it, but I see myself as a movement builder, and AARP is just one part of the puzzle. You know, um, my work around building a more fair and just and equitable society for all led me to this work. And so as you think about your values, keep in mind, it may lead you to places that you would never think that you'd be. If you were to tell me five years ago that I was going to be doing the work I'm doing at AARP, I probably would have said, you need to get off that stuff. <laughs> um, so, you know, surrender to your deeply held values and um, you'll be amazed at where those values take you. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Quentin. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have, but I hope that uh, this chat has been meaningful to you. I hope it sparked um, you know, some deep-seated thinking. Uh, and uh, don't forget, I'm betting on you to be a game changer because the world sure needs it. All right, students. Um you first, as always, but alums, parents, our colleagues. If you've got questions, we'd love to see them, love to hear them. Uh, there's a lot there for, for you to sit with and unpack for sure. So you can throw it in the chat, but of course we're gonna ask you to likely read it aloud. Um, I'll get one going just from kind of my knowing a bit about you. Uh, tell us where like your, like your desire to be a movement builder start, like where did it start? And I, I know there's some stories in here you could share. Um, kind of how did you begin doing some of this work? 
That's a gr that's a great question. You know, um, I think part of it is in the blood, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, you know, my my father grew up in Ghana, West Africa, uh, near the height of the Pan African movement. Um, in fact, my dad was born in Ghana uh, when Ghana was still under the colonial rule of the British uh, in 1950. Um, my mother grew up in uh, the Tampa Bay area near the height of the civil rights movement. Uh, my parents met in college in Texas and had me many years later in California. Um, and so uh, I think the lived experiences of my parents have certainly uh, influenced my worldview. Uh, it certainly influenced my politics. I think um, at the age of seven, um, uh, you know, after Nelson Mandela was released uh, after being in prison for 27 years, he did a world tour. And one of the stops on the tour was the Oakland Coliseum, the Oakland Coliseum. And, you know, I remember, you know, that Saturday going to the Oakland Coliseum to hear Nelson Mandela speak. And it was the biggest thing uh, to do. It was, it was, I felt like everybody that my family knew was at the Oakland Coliseum that day. It was so important. And at seven years old, you don't grasp the fullness of a Nelson Mandela and his story and what he means for to the people of South Africa and the people around the world. Um, but what I could gather at the age of seven uh, is that this is someone who um, is a powerful demonstration of the human spirit. This is somebody uh, who could have chosen to be very bitter, um, but instead chose a path of forgiveness and reconciliation. This is what a bridge builder looks like. And so in some grand ways and small ways um, throughout my life, uh, in my career and uh, in service to my communities, I have on some level aspired to um, be the kind of bridge builder and the kind of force for good uh, that Nelson Mandela demonstrated to me at age seven. Um, I see in the chat, I'd love to hear more about the work you did with Oprah <laughs> and what you learned uh, from that about uh, what's effective or ineffective in organizing or really anything you think is worth talking about from that experience. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and thank you for doing your research. <laughs> um, so if you look at, if you go to YouTube, you'll see a, a clip of me as a, thir a 13 year old me, that was a long time ago. Uh, uh, on the Oprah show, uh, I, um, I mean, I think that experience really put me on the trajectory that I'm on today. Uh, Oprah had launched uh, a campaign, it was called Oprah's Angel Network, and it was intended to uh, raise money to send uh, deserving students, high potential students uh, to college, students that were chosen by the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And it just, seemed, it just seemed like a simple idea. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And I was on student council at the time. And so um, you know, I organized my classmates and we did a huge fundraising drive. And you know, this was before Twitter and Facebook and all that. And I'm not old, by the way. <laughs> um, but it was, it was way before that. And um, it was really just about doing the right thing. You know, just really, again, you know, do what you can from where you are with what you have. And I remember coming home the day before the rally and my mom, oh, I love this part of the story. Um, coming home the day before the, the rally, my mom was on the phone in the kitchen and she just had this weird look on her face. And, you know, she gets off the phone and she's like, I was just talking to Oprah's people and they said, Oprah really uh, appreciates what you're doing and she wants to meet you. She wants you to be her guest in Chicago. She wants you to be on her show. Uh, and Oprah's folks wanted me to be on the show along with my mom. Uh, and to give you all a sense of who my mother is, this is like full circle. Um, my mother uh, did the one thing that I think, you know, most folks in America probably wouldn't have done. Uh, you know, she said, 
as much as I would love to go, I think he should go with his father. He should go with his father because you don't see enough black young men on daytime television with their fathers. And, you know, having that experience with my dad who, you know, has since passed away is uh, one of the greatest gifts that I get to carry for the rest of my life. Uh, and uh, so that was an extraordinary experience. And, 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 you know, just back to your question around, you know, what I learned about organizing, uh, you know, I learned that you do what's right, do what you feel is right to lead with your values, you know, um, so much of being a movement builder is doing what you believe is the right thing when people aren't looking. I didn't know that Oprah was looking, but apparently she was, she was, and, and, and you know, the rest is history. What else do you got? <laughs> You know, the professor in me, you know, uh, uh, can very easily turn around and ask you all some questions as well, if that's allowed. That's totally allowed. Yeah. Yeah. They're used to it. They're used to it? Um, you know, so not seeing any uh, additional questions, you know, um, uh, I want to hear from um, some of the young people. I don't know if there are any folks that are listening that are on student council at your school. Um, but, you know, I would love to learn about um, what this moment in our nation's history is teaching you about being a leader. Are there any student council members that are, that are here? We have some people who are leaders in other groups as well on campus so that can answer. I see Yenny on here. I'm going to point her out. I think she'd be a great first person to answer this question. Yenny or Yimmy? Yenny. Yenny. Yenny, I want to hear from you. Hi. Um, I was listening, but I was making my oatmeal. Could you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> sure, sure. Yenny, I, I was asking, you know, um, what has or what is this moment in our nation's history? What is it teaching you as a student leader about leadership? Oh, that's a, that's a new question. I've had a lot of interviews lately and that's not one that I've been asked. Um, I think definitely being persistent with a lot of things because it's often so easy to like be there for like maybe a month or two and then forget about, forget about what's happening in the world. And that, that applies to both leadership roles, but it also applies to like the outside world. Like lately, like two months ago when everything was happening, when a lot of like things were happening at the same time, overlapping a lot of students, a lot of teachers, a lot of faculty, well, not faculty, but like a lot of human beings were like, oh, let's advocate for change. Let's do this, let's do that. Mm -hmm. And now today in the present day, it's like people forgot about it. Like it's not even a big deal anymore. They're like, it's like that performative allyship that's happening can also happen in leadership roles. So like being persistent about what you want and how you want to change it and like knowing why you're doing it is like definitely something that is important to see today. Like the why aspect is very important to me personally. Like I, why I do things is important to know like the root cause, the background of the importance of doing or of participating in something. I don't know if that answered your question. Please let me know if I did it. No, it do, it does it does and 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 you know continue to to um, hold tight to that you know hold tight to understanding what your why is. I think uh, Malcolm Gladwell um, uh, does a series of talks and mentions it in a number of his books around sort of understanding your why, right? And and once you can get clear about what your why is, then the what and the how um, you know becomes so much uh, easier to uh to 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 understand and to map out i see in the chat uh lisa greenbaum um asked the question how would you encourage appropriate allyship in a school environment what about a corporate environment um you know i th I, I think so much about um i think i think of allyship as an on-ramp right it's uh, your on-ramp to 
um, uh, you know, becoming uh, a champion uh, for the things that you believe. It's not even so much becoming a, a champion for other people, right? I mean, you know, if, if you believe in equality, right? It's not that you believe in equality just for this group over here, but you believe in it. You believe in the, the concept of equality, right? You know, if, if you um, believe in feminism, for example, you know, the, you know, political, social, and economic equality between all sexes, if you believe in that, you know, it's, it, you're not just being an ally to women, right? That's important to men as well. It's important that we um, teach men how to, how to be, uh, how to cha be champions of feminism, for example. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I would encourage, uh, a, a, you know, when I think of allyship in a school environment or a corporate environment, um, I encourage folks to listen more um, you know, to understand that no, no one has a monopoly on good ideas and that, you know, um, being an ally, being a champion can look a lot of different ways, right? The key is communication. So, cause if I don't understand your why, if you're trying, but I don't understand your why, then, um, you know, I may not connect with what you're doing. You know, the last thing I'll say is that there's a difference between communicating and connecting. And, you know, don't we know it? We have a million Zoom calls <laughs> that we do these days on a, on, on a regular basis, right? That's a lot of communication, right? But when you take the time to do your research and understand who your audience is, to understand who you're talking to, when you take the time to do that, you know, then there's an opportunity to connect with people in a meaningful way, in a way that, that they will hold on to and carry with them even beyond the time and space that you're in. I hope I answered your question, Lisa Greenbaum. I, I, uh, I, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, in our, with our remaining time, um, oh, here we go. From Yinny, how do we respond to performative allyship? Do we allow them to continue? Do we educate them? Do we call them out? Like I mentioned earlier, we see a lot of people say and post that they advocate for different movements such as BLM, women's rights against kids in cages, but never speak out against the discrimination occurring? How should we respond? That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, I think we all have to um, be conscious of um, our energy. And you know, a lot of this, a lot of this comes down to, well, you know, how do you want to spend your energy? you know, uh, because you could wear yourself out, you know, just responding, you know, to people who say things that they maybe don't mean, maybe don't understand, right? A lot of people saying the right thing, you know, but doing something different. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's important to focus on the, those opportunities to influence people that are open. So the key is, are they open? You know, and how do you know if somebody's open, right? Remember what I said about transformation earlier? Transformation happens when people are willing to begin to re-examine some of their underlying assumptions. And so you know, you know if somebody is willing to re-examine some of their underlying assumptions or if they are stuck on what they believe, you know? And if folks are persuadable, if folks are open, I would encourage you to, you know, communicate with them, you know? Um, you know, invite them to be um, among you and, and, and among other folks that share your values, right? Um, invite them to get to know you. You know, there, you know, there are so many, and oftentimes people 
respond to who they think folks are before they ever really meet the real person. And so that's the advice that I would uh, offer you in terms of responding. And I see that um, ACM McKay, this is a parent, I suspect, in the world of ally actions and behaviors, what is simply not helpful, but something we allies might frequently do? Um, uh, I think one thing that allies frequently do um, is they don't listen. <laughs> You know, it, 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 it sounds simple and I'm, my, my computer is dying. And so if you don't mind for a moment, I'm going to plug my, my computer in for a moment. Give me one moment. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, allies need to listen more. Um, you know, a, you know, allies need to understand that one's lived experience is very powerful. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, for folks that show up at the rallies and the events, you know, that's nice, but you get to go home. You know, you get to sort of leave that behind, right? Um, especially if you don't see that as a demonstration of your values, right? And so, uh, you know, activism isn't a nice to do. I think sometimes we take a charitable approach you know, and I think what the, the times are asking for now is not so much ch charity, but change. You know, um, you know, and I oftentimes, you know, ask folks, you know, how do your val values, if you're in a position of power, influence, authority, you know, how do they show up in the way that you plan, in the way that you budget, in the way that you forecast, in the way that you evaluate, in the way that you research? Right. So, you know, don't just say, OK, you know, we're going to we're going to show up at pride, this pride festival this month. We're going to demonstrate our allyship this year by showing up at pride. But then what do you do the other 11 months out of the year? You know, how are you creating safe spaces? How are you making helping folks to feel like they belong? You know, how are you affirming the the humanity and the dignity of in this example, LGBTQ people throughout the year, you know, uh, and also, you know, learning, you know, we want, you know, I, you know, my inner geek <laughs> loves a good book, right? Uh, and so I encur encourage everybody to be lifelong learners. You know, there are some really great books out there around anti-racism, um, you know, uh, the book White Fragility, um, uh, is a must read. I think uh, uh, a lot of folks should, should check that out. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, you know, Between the World and Me, you know, um, uh, that's certainly something that I um, intend to have my nephews reading, uh, you know, when, when they get a little bit older. Um, and so um, reading, listening, um, change, not charity, uh, I think those are, are, uh, pr those are probably, uh, 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 good ways to start, um, being, you know, better allies and ultimately better champions. How do we combat judgments about allyship? We have a social media culture that exacerbates armchair activism. You know, I mean, there's been a lot that's been shared recently about cancel culture. You all familiar with that, cancel culture? Uh, and, and, and Quentin, I think we might have talked a little bit about this uh, 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 last time we spoke. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think a lot of the folks on social media, uh, you know, are, you know, some folks say the things they'd never say to your face, you know, uh, but that cuts both ways. <laughs> you know, sometimes it, there's some things that people say that that uh, sort of cuts through the noise. Um, and, you know, uh, activism on social media is one piece of the puzzle. It's not all of it. It's one piece of it. I mean, look at what's happened in, you know, uh, in terms of movements in different parts of the world, just using social media, 
You know, you look at some of the um, organizing work happening in Hong Kong. You look at some of the organizing work, you know, happening. Uh, uh, remember the Arab Spring, right? Um, you know, I mean, that was uh, a use of Twitter and social media that we hadn't in, in mass that we hadn't seen before, right? Um, look at Black Lives Matter. Look at Me Too. Um, you know, so many of these movements have been amplified. And you've even heard, you know, folks like John Lewis say that, oh my goodness, if, you know, the Black Civil Rights Movement um, of the 60s, if they had some of the tools that we had today, they would be so much more efficient uh, in, in uh, the, the struggle that they had taken up. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I see that as, as, as uh, an important piece of the puzzle. It's not everything, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. And thank you for posting these articles, the Atlantic piece on cancel culture, uh, teenage cancel culture. You know, um, we've got to be willing to hear things that we don't agree with. Uh, and, um, you know, I don't, you know, I just, I just don't think that we want to, um, cancel folks without, you know, uh, uh, really understanding uh, where they might be coming from, right? Now, there are some, certain, certain things, there's content that is toxic um, that we, and we should be conscious about what we consume, um, but we shouldn't have this knee-jerk reaction to, you know, cancel the things that we don't agree with because then we end up existing in a bubble. And we, we end up um, being, becoming champions of confirmation bias. And, and um, I don't think that that, uh, uh, that really moves us forward. Um, you know, it, it gives us maybe even a false sense of security. And you're someone that I, I know to be a movement builder in lots of ways. You do work around uh, a number of different issues. Um, and the work is hard. It's emotional, I imagine. Um, yet you're also someone who champions joy. Like how, do you, how do you do that for yourself? How do you manage to think about, seek, find, spread joy when you're doing this kind of emotionally charged work. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 I appreciate the question. And, you know, it, it takes, you know, there's some days where I'm, you know, um, where my joy tank uh, is more full than other days. Um, but, uh, you know, I lean on um, uh, the prayer of peace by St. Francis of Assisi. You know, I, I went to, you know, Catholic school and, and that prayer was drilled into us. And so, um, you know, staying prayerful in that way, uh, the serenity prayer, you know, may God grant me the ability to accept the things I cannot change and uh, the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference, um, you know, uh, on some of the tough days and in the toughest moments, uh, uh, that is a prayer that I lean on, um, you know, and, uh, you know, by the age of 22, I'd experienced sort of a great deal of loss, a string of losses, mentors and friends. And um, I have a, an older brother who had committed suicide and I had uh, my father, you know, who died suddenly of an aneurysm the year after. And so by the time I was 22, I would experienced a great deal of, of loss. And, um, you know, th those experiences uh, really sort of put you in touch with your mortality. I mean, you almost carry your mortality with you everywhere you go. And so it left me with the sense of this drive to, um, to, to, leave, to, 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 to leave a mark on the world. Uh, and, um, you know, that um, excites me, it, 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 it fills me up. Um, and the opportunity to do some good in the world, uh, it should put a smile on anybody's face. Uh, and, and so I found that those things are 
have become over the years a tremendous source of joy for me. We have another question in the chat, looks like. Um, Ashton, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Ashton, I like the way you spell that, by the way. Ashton um, Towels, I hope I, I got that right. He says, hi, thank you so much for moderating the session. Um, my name is Ashton and I graduated from USN in 2015. On cancel culture, how do we differentiate between the dangers of hate speech versus free speech? Oh, wow. Um, Ashton, are you on your way to graduate school? Because uh, that's a great master's thesis, if not uh, uh, some great dissertation research there. Um, differentiating between the dangers of hate speech and free speech. Uh, you know, certainly as I sit here as a black gay man, um, you know, I, you know, that, um, uh, that's a, a, it's a, uh, a, a clear and present danger. Um, uh, and it's tough. I mean, we see, you know, companies like Facebook, um, in the news, um, you know, more often than not these days and a number of other tech companies to be fair in the news that are really struggling with that, differentiating between hate speech versus free speech. You know, there are things that we say, there's colloquial language that we use when we are among, um, you know, folks that we're comfortable with, folks that may be uh, part of our families, our friend circles, um, where if, uh, you know, a computer program, we're listening in on our conversation, um, you know, they might misread certain things as being hate speech, right? Um, and may respond by um, canceling your account or suspending your account. You know, we've certainly seen examples uh, of this. And so um, uh, I think it's important that we continue to get to know each other. It's important that the engineers and, and computer programmers, for example, um, uh, get outside of their closed network. I mean, this is, you know, confirmation bias uh, shows up in so many different forms. Um, and when we don't have exposure to people that are different from us, um, it, you know, it allows us to um, uh, understand things uh, in ways that may not be accurate. Uh, and so uh, I think that's where we can start. But Ashton, I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for you to, uh, to uh, investigate that further. Uh, you know, there's no time like the present. Um, you know, one, one of my wild and crazy dreams, if I could share this with you all, one of my wild and crazy dreams, uh, in, in terms of making change in the world, um, you know, how cool would it be to have a digital constitution, right? What would a digital constitution look like? Uh, you know, and I'm thinking of something very much in the vein of the UN Declaration on Human Rights. How, how amazing was that? After World War II, you had over a hundred countries from around the world, people that, you know, don't speak the same language, people don't pray to the same God if they pray to God at all, that came together and mapped out, hey, these are inalienable human rights, right? You know, this is what we can agree on. Non-binding, but this is what we can agree on. So imagine what we could do in the digital space to answer that very important question that Ashton shared around, um, making clear what the rules of the road are in terms of hate speech versus free speech. So Ashton, we're counting on you, counting on you to lead the charge. I see Josh asked the question, how do allies help create the right environment where students and families inside and outside our walls embrace our school as a safe and desirable place to learn and develop as a person of color? How do allies help create the right environment? Um, Allies help, and help to create the right environment when, um, when uh, folks in the minority can share what they're experiencing without fear of being further marginalized. That's important. You know, for people to be able to, to hold folks accountable, 
um, without fear that, you know, they're going to be ostracized or they're going to be treated like the troublemaker or, um, you know, I think there's that piece of it. And, you know, nobody wants to feel like it's just, it's only their job, you know, to call things out, right? And so, you know, allies need to do a better job calling things out. And, and one of the things I say is that, you know, so often, um, you know, uh, you know, some of us feel like, you know, we are charged with doing extra credit, but the thing is we never get the extra credit. Right. Uh, and so, you know, we need everybody to do their work. Um, and that means allies um, got to step up. You got to step up. You got to have those uncomfortable conversations when questions about race or sexual orientation come up. You can't look to the, you know, the gay person in the room or look to the black person in the room and say, guess that's your question. So um, I think that's probably a good place to start. Uh, Quentin says, for those of you who think about very contemporary applications of programming and artificial uh, intelligence work, this is some of the work being done. Oh, thanks for sharing that article. And one last question before we clo close out, you know, who has the final question? And I'm very impressed. I mean, you know, this is, you know, after nine o'clock Eastern time, you know, and, and, uh, I'm sure I'm competing with some programming on Netflix uh, or or uh, one of the networks. And so I am thrilled that you all want to spend so much time here. Well, hearing no other final uh, questions, um, I really just want to say thank you to uh, Quentin and thank you to uh, the teachers and administrators and parents and to the students for being a part of this conversation, um, I am betting on you. I mean, I, I, and, and, and I would love to come back, maybe even in person, um, to learn uh, um, however way this talk may have been meaningful to you or inspiring to you. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm betting on you, and I think the world is betting on you all to um, lead us in a, in a uh, towards a more fair, just, and equitable society. I think you have everything it takes, and apparently you have uh, some of the best teachers and administrators that also believe in you uh, giving their best. And so thanks to everyone. Continue to be amazing. Thanks to the organizers, that's right. Barbecue on us next time. Okay, Jim Manning, I'm going to hold you to that. Thank you, Quentin. Of course, yes. Um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your time kind of with us. And it gives me to personally connect with you again and, and share a bit of you with USN. Um, by way of parting thoughts, um, let me go to my colleagues. Is there anything you all want to leave? This is our, I'll say, at least I'll commit, this is our final salon session for now. I'll leave it open and see what we do uh, as the, the spirit moves us later. But uh, any final words around for my black colleagues? I just want to thank folks for coming, you know, seeing you week after week. Um, I've just been impressed by the number of people who are willing to show up and the insightfulness of the questions. Um, I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, so thank you to you all for continuing to teach me and speakers like uh, the one we had today for doing that. So thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you. I want to piggyback on that and just say thank you all for showing up. It's um, We've all learned a lot. As you probably have noticed that each of us took different weeks and uh, in that we learned a lot from our speakers kind of aside from this conversation as well. And um, I know from last week, those two definitely are like, we would love to come back in person and, and chat with you, you guys at USN even more. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for asking very thoughtful questions. Um, thanks for the emails because you guys have sent emails and resources and, and thanks and people asked about thank you notes. So thank you just for being you and, and being here. This is why we're part of this community. So that's all I got.
I'll just say for me, um, this was a, a late night idea that we had as we were talking. I literally sent the five people who have worked on this an email and said, hey, what if we do this as our kind of love letter to the school and to the community? Um, for me, this was really about, I needed something really good in my life right now, uh, and this was it. I'm like, I, I can help organize this for this school and this community. So uh, I'm so glad to have been able to learn from these people and uh, my colleagues and all the people we've brought to you all as a USN community. Uh, as I think Nicole said, the reading list that we've compiled out of these conversations is, is really something. Um, and there's lots for us, for us to keep doing and, and learning. But really, this was as much for me as it was for for I think the community. So thanks for letting us do do some of that work as well. Quentin, yep. if, if, if there is one more book I could offer, one more book recommend, yeah. right, it would be The Source of Self-Regard by Toni Morrison. It's a collection of short stories and of essays and of speeches uh, that she's given. I think it might've been uh, the last book uh, that she published uh, before she passed away. Uh, you know, she is a gift to literature, Toni Morrison, uh, her work. Uh, and so the source of self-regard, um, uh, it may take you all summer to read it, uh, but it is incredible, incredible. So the source of self-regard. Excellent. We'll put it on the list for sure. I want to say one thing, um, and this is in regards to what's in the chat. If you, I, I'm, I'm excited and, and thankful that everyone showed up as well. Um, if you miss one of the sessions, uh, Nita Trauber has placed all the recording for all the sessions. I encourage you wholeheartedly and all the way, please look at the recordings, listen to them, um, see what you've missed. We've been very excited. I think it was also a thing for me. I needed some, I needed some happiness and some goodness in my life. And so I've been excited about this. I'm just excited that everyone has been here. And I encourage everyone, please, if you miss one, go check it out. Go there. And thank Mrs. Schrauber for putting it there. That's what I have to say. Vince said he sees AARP in a whole new light now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I'm sure. Um, that could just be from his age, Nicole. <laughs> I'm not so embarrassed to have one of those cards now. I'm just saying, you know, I want to be flashing it wherever I go. Hey, that's great. That's great. We might put you in our next commercial if you flash it enough. <laughs> <laughs> just make sure you want a USN shirt when they take your picture, okay? <laughs> For sure. Deal, deal, deal. Well, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank, thank you all so much, friends. Thanks for coming out. We'll be in touch soon, USN Community, about other things that we're working on. But so glad we've been a part of this together. And uh, we will see you soon. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Right, take care.